Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Welcome to this session. I've been asked to read a brief script before we, we, we start. Um, firstly, about Telegram. We'd like to bring to your attention the QR code featured on your badge, which directly links to the official Telegram channel of the Astana International Financial Center. We highly recommend subscribing to this channel to stay updated on all the latest information regarding the conference. By subscribing, you will receive timely updates on upcoming sessions, topics, and locations, as well as gain access to useful materials from spe speakers' presentations and captivating event photos. If the photos are too captivating, there are lots of lawyers to sort that out. The sponsors would like to extend a sincere appreciation to the conference Golden Partners, Visa, Freedom Holding Corporation, and ITS companies for their fruitful cooperation and support. In relation to fire safety, in the unlikely event of a fire, for your safety in the case of a fire, kindly note that the emergency exits can be found in the, main, in the mini atrium between block C3.4 and C3.3 and in the zone after the elevators. Thank you. One of the captions of this conference is AIFC at the forefront of finance. And what we're going to be doing in this session is exploring what that means in, 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 in practice. Among the many objectives of the AIFC are to promote investment into Kazakhstan, addressing domestic financing structures and the efficient use of capital within the country, and the development of a viable business center as an economic unit on its own. Now, what does that take? It clearly takes various forms of infrastructure. We have the very obvious physical infrastructure, which is this remarkable and impressive complex in which we are located now. There is also a legal and regulatory regime, which, among many others, I have been involved with since its in inception. There is a body of advisors to give effect to this. And, of course, there is the court and the International Arbitration Center. I'm not going to go into any detail about those. There's a separate conference happening, a separate session happening about those at the moment. But I would just note the remarkable success which has been achieved uh, with over 2,000 judgments delivered uh, from a, a huge range of, 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 of countries. And perhaps particularly reassuring for international investors and international third parties is that a number of the cases have involved Kazakh state entities which have been unsuccessful, which have lost their cases, and enforcement has proceeded entirely smoothly, which is a great credit both to the state institutions and to the uh, dispute resolution structures here. So who are the participants in this overall structure? There's the AIFC structures itself. We're going to hear more about this, of course, but AFSA, the regulator, AIX, the exchange, and, of course, the, the team of people who are our hosts, looking after us all so well. Uh, and it has been my experience the most exceptional quality of individuals working at the AIFC. There are the companies which are seeking investment or looking to restructure their internal holding arrangements or cash flows. There are domestic and international investors, both those wishing to find a home for their money, but also having invested are looking for secure and effective management of their funds on a longer term basis. And then there's the advisory group of which many of us are a part. For 
all these different groups, there are different criteria, and I'm not obviously going to go into the details of those at the moment, but the basic concepts of clarity, stability, confidence, uh, and uh, transparency are critical, and flexibility, and one of the great advantages of this regime is that if things are not working out from a regulatory point of view, there is the ability to speak to the regulators and get them changed. There is the development of innovative products, a supportive regulatory regime, and supportive institutions such as the Stock Exchange, but bearing in mind the balance between investor protection and the requirements of the companies, and a regime under which advisors can advise with clarity and confidence. So that is the regulatory and physical infrastructure in which we are all operating. And in this session, we're going to look at two basic issues. The first is the creation of holding companies. And the second uh, is means of, of financing uh, in various ways, uh, including uh, through uh, investment funds, through listing on the stock exchange, uh, and also uh, through uh, direct investment into uh, the companies. So the first speakers are Alicia and Asset. I'm going to invite them to describe themselves. And they're going to be talking about uh, AFC as a jurisdiction of choice for holding companies. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I said, shall I start? Yes. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you here. My name is Alessia Kirilovska. I'm a legal partner in Deloitte. And uh, being uh, part of Big Four, uh, naturally, we do advise our clients on the most attractive ways to structure their investments. And IFC has a lot of interest recently because it's a very interesting jurisdiction. But uh, it's close to home. It has the benefits of English law. It has some tax benefits. So it is very um, interesting for the investors. And IFC does allow uh, some tax benefits for the holding companies. Uh, I'm not going to talk about tax benefits in detail, uh, but um, as a general, IFC is quite uh, interesting. And we see the, the, the holding company's trend globally is dying down a bit because with all the new introduction of uh, UBO disclosure rules, with all the exchange of information between the countries, uh, the classic holding structures which were typically put in place to kind of separate the UBO from the business is now changing. Uh, with introduction of multilateral instrument and pr principal purpose test, everything is changing. So now, uh, while on IFC holding companies are still available, we are trying to explore more and advise our, our clients very carefully whether uh, it's good to use them or not currently. Uh, we do advise that holding companies or IFC are beneficial ways to structure the investments and um, currently some benefits are provided and of course the benefits of the court which Simon has mentioned is also quite attractive to the investors. Um, however, um, I guess I will pass the word to Asiad because here we were discussing previously on how good it actually is and what are the different opinions from the big four of, on these holding companies. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Alessia. And my name is Asset, and uh, I'm a CEO of, uh, of a fund manager uh, named Provident Fiduciary. We do our business here in AFC, uh, structure various um, acquisitions for mostly for foreign investors, uh, guys who come in and purchase uh, private companies in Kazakhstan, and. Uh, of course, as Alessia says, uh, the key, the simplest way uh, to invest is to, to go in, set up a private company here in AFC and uh, have that company uh, hold various like, privately held comp <coughs> companies or assets directly. And uh, the benefits, tax benefits Alessia was talking about was, uh, are uh, uh, exemptions on uh, um, in, uh, income tax for dividends uh, for, and for capital gains. And uh, <coughs> here I think the most important part is to understand and to remember that the whole idea of setting up uh, the AFC was to promote uh, development of capital markets, uh, promote creation of 
financial instruments and various investment vehicles available to investors. And this is the main purpose of this whole uh, <laughs> structure. And um, some of the companies, they, uh, some of the local companies, they, uh, they uh, use extensively, I think, starting from this, from this year, having, uh, in, having in place some changes in local tax regulations regarding dividends, regarding capital gains, and uh, I think it, it might become an issue in future, but as Alessia says, currently everything works. Yes. Yes, yeah, so why holding company is so attractive to investors? Because holding company does not hold a license. Holding company does not have to be listed. So simply by virtue of registering a company on IFC in any form, private company or else, which is widely available on IFC, you can enjoy those benefits, which is quite interesting for the investors because it's, uh, frankly speaking, very simple. And uh, the benefits are there, the legislation is there, framework is there, so uh, it is available. I see the concerns which this scheme may raise, like I has mentioned that there may, may be an issue. So what exactly is the issue? Uh, first of all, because these benefits are provided under the general tax legislation rather than uh, specific IFC legislation because these are not regulated and licensed services. So this depends largely on the current tax regime. And if it's changed, then uh, the benefits are also changed and there is no more benefits, basically. However, uh, till the time it is in place, it can be used. And uh, generally, any kind of uh, tax uh, framework generally lasts from five to ten years so for this period which IFC has been already lasting it has proven to be effective uh, uh, so I will leave it to you to, s to <laughs> tell more about the issues that you may see with this going forward I think there is one issue which I I'm not going to ask lots of questions now because we're on a short time frame but something which if we have time at the end it may be worth looking at is the use of things like Treasury companies within a group which could use the IX to issue debt securities and then flow the money down through the group. Um, but I think I could just, if I can leave that in the air and we'll come back to that in due course, if we can allow it. Thank you. I would now get moving on to uh, financing business through the use of the capital markets. And there are lots of different sessions going on about capital markets um, today. But um, Evgenia and Barry are going to talk about AX listing, uh, listing more generally with uh, domestic and international examples and also she's going to give us some insight into the uh, announcements made by the Governor today. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, my name is Evgenia Bogdanova. Uh, I work at Astana International Exchange and I'm responsible for regulation and compliance at the exchange. So just to reflect on the comments, so when we were discussing setting up uh, new holdings in AFC, there is a, another option for existing businesses with existing corporate history and branding, and if you want to preserve that, uh, there is an option of redomicilation. Basically, AFC jurisdiction offers that option to redomicile. So what does it mean, redomicilation? It means you change the place of your registration, so from one uh, jurisdiction to AFC. And AFC offers that option as well, so uh, owners of existing businesses may consider that option uh, as an alternative for setting up a new holding company. And basically, we have one uh, good precedent on redomicilation for our public issuer. Uh, you might uh, heard that it's a company, a mining company, Polymetal. They are moving their headquarters from Jersey to AFC, and they have their listing history from 2019 on Astana International Exchange. So their uh, listing venue uh, AX will become a primary listing venue once the redomicilation is completed. So speaking of capital markets, uh, is it possible to turn on uh, the slides, please? Yes, so, so speaking of capital markets and role of the exchange, uh, next. Basically, for what, what does it mean for businesses? Uh, the exchange would increase visibility and scalability of the business. On the one hand, and for investors, uh, they get uh, the transparent information 
about potential investment and that information is required to make their investment decision. Uh, then for businesses, exchange would offer reliable infrastructure to attract new capital. Uh, for investors, there is a wide range of investment instruments uh, into which they can invest depending on their risk appetite and demand. Next slide, please. So let's speak a, a bit in more detail about the products uh, which AX offers. So basically, the, you, you can invest through conventional shares and bonds, but we also have tailored instruments such as commercial papers. Commercial papers are short-term bonds uh, which are issued for the period up to one year. And we would expect issuers of the commercial papers to meet uh, requirements for high credit worthiness. And once the program for commercial paper is set up, the issuer would be able to raise capital quite quickly within two, three business days. Uh, and usually the aim of this capital is to finance short-term work, working capital needs, like to pay salaries or to finance operational expenses which are linked to core business. Also sometimes uh, issuers have a big diversified holding structure and some of the entities like cash generating, some of the entities are cash consuming and uh, you need efficient instrument to redistribute liquidity within the group. So for such uh, issuers we offer uh, so-called liquidity management program which will allow um, multiple issuers uh, to do uh, intergroup financing through uh, capital ma markets instruments. And it's worth mentioning on Islamic financing, um, Simon mentioned the Tabadul project. Tabadul project will be signed uh, today in the afternoon during the capital markets session. Uh, what is Tabadul project? It's a network of exchanges uh, in Gulf, uh, Gulf countries and basically AX becoming a member of that network. And that network allows mutual uh, access to our markets and our products. That means that trading members of AX would offer its clients, investors, products which are listed and traded uh, on the other markets uh, in Gulf countries. Uh, the, the other instrument is uh, ESG, uh, environmental social governance, remain the hot topic. And we see demand from our issuers for specifically tailored instruments to finance their sustainability projects. And for that purpose, we have the whole range of sustainable bonds, like green, social. And uh, our framework allows issue any labeled ESG labeled bonds and for that uh, basically if there is an established international recognized standard then uh, AX would consider that standard and that will allow you to issue on our platform uh, any instrument which would meet the requirement of that international uh, standard and you would be able to label it social, transit, blue bonds, whatever bonds is required for your business. Uh, on listings, so you could do it through conventional in, in initial public offering or secondary public offering uh, with capital raise or some issuers uh, already have a diversified investor base and they don't have an immediate need for new capital. But they need efficient uh, venue for their existing investors which uh, could acquire shares during some private round placements. Uh, they need a venue for them to exit investment or exchange investment so to, to trade it efficiently. And for that purpose we offer so-called direct listing. Uh, that means that the private company could become a public and 
we won't ask them on the entry to satisfy free float requirement or market capitalization requirement. And uh, those requirements will be delayed by one year. And on the first anniversary, we expect that those requirements will be met. And that would be done through uh, the undertaking of the founding shareholders uh, to sell down to decrease their holdings by at least 15%. And it means that during IPO, you sell it in one stake. During direct listing, you could sell it in so-called piecemeal trading. So by small pieces, when you feel the need or you have an investor who could buy it on the open market through transparent uh, structure and uh, mechanism. Uh, the, the, the other service is direct subscription that was tested uh, la last year during the KMG IPO. Uh, we offer our issuers a special software platform called Tabith, and that platform allows issuers establish direct uh, communication with small retail investors. So direct subscription would suit only um, retail investors who pursue buy and hold strategy. In case an investor wishes to trade actively, then uh, such investor would need to open classical brokerage account. Uh, but those who just want to subscribe and hold, uh, they could do it through Tabis application. Uh, then we have different segments. Basically, main board segment is good and suitable for large capitalization uh, issuers uh, who consider offering on AX market and some other international recognized markets, and I will let Barry talk about uh, uh, cross-border offerings. Then we have a regional equity market segment uh, for smaller and, and medium-sized businesses. Uh, junior mining, basically self-explanatory, uh, that segment uh, for mining business, which is uh, going through exploration work, and they need financing to start production. So uh, those issuers are welcome to place their securities in junior mining segment. And then we have a dedicated Belt and Road segment that is for infrastructure projects. Next slide, please. <laughs> So we have various instruments, various segments, and uh, the requirements would reflect uh, the structure of the instrument and maturity of the business. I will not stop here, but uh, you could take a look uh, later. And if you have any questions, we, uh, there will be contact details at the end of the presentation, and you are welcome to send them to us directly. Next slide, please. Can I ask a question, actually, without, without emailing you? <laughs> um, just going back, can we just go back one slide? Um, in relation to a startup, for example, a tech startup, um, how would that work? That top line means you have to have a year's trading, does it? Or is there a mechanism whereby a tech startup or a fund uh, which has not got any trading history can get a listing? Yeah, basically, you, for, for equity listing, uh, you still require at least one year financial statements audited by independent auditor. Uh, for more mature businesses, which like look for dual listing, cross listing, uh, we would require three year financials, and they need to demonstrate revenue earning record. So uh, that is kind of the basic difference. On timing, uh, so the, the next slide, basically the listing process could take from three business days up to eight weeks for full-scale IPO. Uh, and yeah, that would depend on the structure and, and the product. And the last slide, so we'll also have a concept of equivalent market. So currently uh, there are 10 markets recognized as equivalent and for those markets, uh, if issuer choose to offer its securities on AX and that recognized market, 
We would only ask one set of the documents uh, which would fit uh, listing eligibility requirements of the alternative uh, equivalent market and our market. So the issue wouldn't be uh, under burden to prepare two sets, sets of documents. And uh, they would prepare one prospectus which would be recognized by AAX and post listing once uh, the issue becomes a reporting entity uh, and it would be required to disclose some information on ongoing basis. Uh, again, AIX wouldn't ask anything beyond the standard uh, which is adopted on, on the equivalent market. And here I, I would like to pass <laughs> forum to Barry to continue on cross listings and cross border offerings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe I just have a, a brief dis uh, dis instruction of myself first. Uh, before that, I also really want to thank um, uh, AFD to invite me to come to share some of my experiences and um, the practice that we did before. Um, I'm Barry Chen, the head of investment banking of CICC in Hong Kong, as well as the head of Asia and Australia of CICC. Um, the second title, which means that we are in fact um, establishing our branches and network in the Asian countries, including Kazakhstan. I think we have been uh, participating as a sponsor for this program since the first um, AFD five years ago or six years ago. So it has been a long way we come to here. Um, I would like to share more is that um, with some of my experiences also in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange uh, before I joined CSC 13 years ago, uh, what we have seen in Hong Kong or in China uh, could be a reference to be relevant for the development of, um, of AIA or uh, AFC. And I wish that what have happened in China, Hong Kong could be a, like a crystal ball for people uh, uh, sitting here and listening to us because uh, maybe five years, ten years later, you'll be able to get those um, profit from those experiences that we have in the uh, Chinese or Hong Kong market. And the fact is that uh, in the two and a half decades, or it is also the reason, the motive that push, that attracts CSCC to come to this market is that is very, some of the commonality between these two market, uh, Kazakhstan market as well as Chinese market, uh, but we happen it like two and a half decades ago, but we see it happening here. So this is certainly a financial motive for CICC to come to this market. And I'll give you some numbers. You may not um, know it or you may not believe it, but uh, for those who first time to, to hear it, you may be surprised. Um, two and a half, I mean almost 30 years ago, when Shanghai and Shenzhen has their own stock market, it, I think it's in 1990s, uh, there were only eight stocks in Shanghai and only five stocks in Shenzhen. Uh, Hong Kong have developed a bit um, earlier, but still a very small market. And we are talking about the market capitalization of these two markets, Shenzhen in Hong Kong, just a few hundred million dollars. But now, uh, for these two markets, we have more than 5,000 stocks listed in Shenzhen and Shanghai together. And the total market by season, I question my colleague who prepared this note for me, but we check it. Now the capitalization for these two markets is $12 trillion. How much has it been growth? For more than like 40,000 times in, in less than 30 years. So I'm expecting there will be also certain similar growth in, in AIX. Uh, believe me or not, that we only have a, a couple of uh, a handful of stock listed here, but I'm very confident that it will go further. And you have, we also see that the characteristic of the Hong Kong or Chinese market is also initially for the Shanghai Central market is very rely on first of all the state-owned enterprises, the government-owned company, and they are also very industrial uh, focused, like. Um, mining or industrial, manufacturing, etc. But then we see as the economy continues to develop, we see some other sectors like energy, ma material financial sectors, 
We see all these uh, financial institutions listed in Shenzhen, Hong Kong, as well as even in New York. Um, and then as the market continues to develop, we have some more spending by the general public, including the consumer. So you see some um, uh, real estate pop, uh, company listed in China. You also see some consumer goods, uh, company like Hire, company like uh, TCL. They, they come as a electrical appliances company initially. And then later on now you see some other company like the IT company. You, you heard about Alibaba, Tencent, and more recently those uh, EV company like Leo or uh, Lee Auto. So this company not just listed in, in mainland China but also in Hong Kong, and i give you some numbers again, is um, for example for the tech company, now it accounts for about one one quarter of the total market, market privatization in Hong Kong. Before that, it's only focused on financial uh, properties. So this comes together with the development of the economy. Um, so again, what we see here is that um, for AIH, we have cash at palm, we have cash moon, I guess, which initially stay on enterprises, which very like industrial focus, very quite similar that what we have seen in China. But if that happened, that's, that will happen here again is we'll go be moving to some private company. we also be moving to some tech company, biotech company, healthcare company, that will be a consumer company. That will be something we're expecting. And I will see that those companies will be able to make use of um, the, the, the liquidity in Hong Kong or in Shanghai market. Uh, again, Nia mentioned about the dual listing. I strongly encourage that p companies listed here should also consider a dual listing in, in Hong Kong, in Shanghai to attract liquidity. And I think also by the time that we have more liquidity or more mature investors here in AIA, those companies in Hong Kong, in China, they should also become considered coming to Hong Kong for, for listing. And I also noted that um, there is a program uh, between AIX and uh, Abu Dhabi uh, ADGM, uh, I see it, it, will it be a Stock Connect version two? In, I mean, Stock Connect is a program between Hong Kong Stock Exchange and Shanghai and Shenzhen that in fact has um, attract a lot of liquidity between these two markets. And again, some numbers. Uh, it, was, uh, it was started about ten, nine years ago in 2014. Um, the initial turnover for that Stock Connect program between mainland China and Hong Kong was only $1.7 billion daily. But now it moved to $12 billion per day. So it is another like six times of more than six times growth in, uh, in less than 10 years. So I hope that that will also similar be happening here between AIA and uh, ADGM. Okay, so I will stop this just here for a while. Maybe later on, if you have any other problem or more question, I'm more than happy to uh, to share and to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll try and do, deal with questions at the, the end. Um, handing back now to Alicia and Asset, um, looking at investment funds, obviously there's just been an investment funds session here, but this is an additional insight into that. Thank you. Just a minute for the slides. So uh, I would like to give a brief overview of the, of the funds which are available on the IFC. Funds are very attractive form of investment because... Is it, is it, is it working? <laughs> okay. I'll do it like this. Thank you. So why are funds on the IFC attractive for investment? Well, first of all, they offer access to the uh, diversified investment portfolio and world-class investment management uh, services. So IFC uh, offers a few forms of funds. So we have to differentiate between forms of funds and then legal organizational structure of these funds. So forms of funds offered on IFC include exempt funds, non-exempt funds, uh, and self-managed funds. Exempt funds are those who offer their units for shares to only limited uh, circle of professional clients or investors, which include such as banks, um, 
insurance companies and other kind of uh, professional players on the market. The non-exempt funds offer their shares or units to non-limited amount of public and then self-managed funds are those who uh, don't have an external fund manager and manage basically themselves. So how the investment funds work, you have to have a fund manager, then you have to have uh, a fund who, which is managed by the investment man fund manager except, uh, except for the self-managed funds. Uh, and now talking about the forms, uh, kind of legal presence of forms for, for funds. Uh, these can be company, which includes private company and investment company, and limited partnerships, which is probably the most interesting one to us because it's mo most uh, interestingly regulated. The uh, funds have certain limitations. For example, fund is a collective investment scheme, so if you are not uh, offering financial services for a long time, or if you are only trading betwe between the investors who are also uh, participants of the fund, this will not be considered as an investment fund for the IFC purposes. So here, these uh, limitations need to be taken into account to determine whether actually this is a fund or not fund. And um, uh, I would not go so into the specifics because, like Simon said, there is a special session. But I would like to uh, point out some practical. Oh, it's not working. Yes, I would like to point out some practical things which we see in practice while advising our clients on uh, setting up of funds on IFC. And being a lawyer, I believe that the most interesting uh, in this is the intersection between the regulation on IFC and Kazakhstan legislation. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about this on the. Um, example of the limited partnership because this is the most interesting. So uh, first of all, uh, w what is a limited partnership? Limited partnership is um, a form where you have general partner and a limited partner. In this case, general partner is a fund manager and the limited partner is investors. So uh, looking at this from the tax standpoint of tax uh, incentives, they are available to legal entities, participants of the IFC and to their shares. So here we already have two issues which we need to look at. Is limited partnership a legal entity and does it have shares? Uh, because we're talking about the general tax regime and IFC regulation, we have this kind of uh, interesting question. Limited partnership is often compared to simple partnership uh, in Kazakh law. In Kazakh law, simple partnership is not a legal entity. So is a limited partnership a legal entity then? Uh, this is not clearly regulated in the IFC uh, regulations. It clearly has legal personality. It can sue and be sued, which is written in the IFC regulations. But does it mean it's the same as a legal entity? Um, according to IFC perspective, uh, limited partnership is treated as a legal entity. So here we have the answer to this question that it's not, I wouldn't say that it's like a straight forward same, but it is treated as such. So let's talk about shares now. Uh, limited partnership have the right to issue units and shares. So what does this mean? Does it mean that the tax incentives are only available to shares but not to units? And this is also not uh, that straightforward because these two instruments are separately regulated by the FC regulations. However, uh, for the purposes of tax exemptions, uh, we understand that they are treated as interchangeable. So uh, the answer to this would be that both units and shares and the limited partnerships can enjoy the incentives. Uh, and another issue is uh, whether in the limited partnership, uh, limited partners actually have management rights and voting rights. Uh, like I said, limited partners, they are not, um, they are just investors and the fund is managed by the general partner and the general partner uh, fund manager has a wide array of rights. So basically it can manage the fund, uh, it can decide the investment and, and all the activities of the fund. So what do limited partners do? They have a limited uh, array of decisions they can make which relate mostly to um, to the displacement of the fund manager and maybe to liquidation of the limited partnership but not too much. I would say that uh, if we look at this from Kazakh legislation uh, perspective it is similar to the preferred shares and joint stock company. But again it's not the same thing because it's not the same legal form. So uh, do they have voting rights or not and do they have the management rights or not? Uh, what we understand is the answer to this question is no, they don't have management rights because they don't actually manage the fund and they don't have voting shares because the voting rights are very limited to the internal affairs of the partnership. Why is that important? Because in Kazakh legislation, if you would like to sell a share, for example, in a limited partnership, you would face a question of consent of competition authorities. And that is applicable to sale of 50% or more of voting shares. So then if the limited partners don't have voting shares and management rights, so does it mean that this is not applicable to them? Uh, this question is still open. Uh, under my interpretation, we can say that potentially could, could be not applicable, but this is not that black and white because there are factors that need to be assessed there as well. 
So uh, this is it from me. I'm passing to Asiat. Yes, I just wanted to briefly speak about uh, how the funds are set up uh, in practice here in Kazakhstan. And uh, yes, we do most of the funds in form of uh, private investment company, uh, not not a partnership. Because as uh, Alessia mentioned, it's like there are a lot of issues to consider when you really build up a partnership and uh, how. Uh, the partners, uh, different partners are going to be treated, how you set up uh, the rights uh, between different classes of shares, instruments, shares, units, preferred shares. So uh, what we do in practice, we, we really set up everything as a private company and uh, investors decide on what would be the design of the fund, what kind of uh, classes of shares are going to be issued, whether units are going to be there, and uh, what the corporate governance of the fund would be, how much power will be given to a fund manager, how much power will be uh, will reside with um, investors themselves. And um, as Alessia mentioned, that uh, there are ways of uh, replicating fund structures through holding companies, much simpler, much cheaper, because uh, having a fund manager is quite, a, quite an expensive uh, exercise, because besides, the fund, besides having a fund manager, you, de you really got to have an infrastructure in place, which is like custody services, uh, maybe administrator, if you do not need a custodian, an audit, an appraiser, so it comes at cost. But uh, some investors, uh, like sophisticated investors, institutional investors, they really choose to have a fund structure in place in rather than having a simple holding structure because the fund structure provides more uh, protection of investor interests. It's more, uh, the rights are more structured and the assets are held more securely because there are indep other independent parties involved in the process. So th this is a big difference. Thank you very much. And clearly there are some interesting issues coming there and I'm sure that AFC are looking at, at how they address these issues to get clarity uh, behind them. Um, our final speaker, Albemis, we you, you can't see it. We have a, a terrifying clock counting down in front of us and I'm afraid that that means we have a very short slot for um, uh, Albemis, but um, can I hand over to you now? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, do you hear me well? Yeah, uh, my name is Alpamis. I am the CEO and founder of uh, investment crowdfunding platform GoCrowd. And before I start, I want to ask the audience, raise your hands if you are familiar with the term investment crowdfunding. Oh, good, good. <laughs> so yeah, so basically investment crowdfunding is when uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, just basic businesses that you may be a customer of every day, uh, they raise funds directly from the general public, the people, through the uh, authorized and licensed crowdfunding platforms, such as GoCrowd. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. So yeah, I'll try to be uh, very quick. So um, our mission is to make investment and fundraising accessible to anyone. And how did we came up to this mission is uh, that it you know, was prior to founding uh, GoCrowd. Before GoCrowd, I was working at the Astana Financial Services Authority, the uh, independent regulator of the AFC. And I was one of the first employees and my work uh, telephone was connected to the call center. And I had a lot of uh, inquiries and requests from general businesses. They were like, hello, is it AFC? I'm like, yes. Uh, I'm a businessman, I want to raise funds, can you help me please? And I'm like, we're here to establish the environment, sorry, if you want to raise funds, you can go to the stock exchange or brokers and investment managers. But uh, in fact, these companies were, are, are small and uh, stock exchange and other uh, financial firms are not interested in such companies and it's really hard and very expensive for them to raise funds. 
So we uh, started to provide alternative uh, method of uh, raising funds. Uh, and by when we started GoCrowd, we didn't even imagine how big uh, the problem is. Uh, next slide, please. So um, actually, in Kazakhstan, around 1.5 million small and medium-sized enterprises need money. And the problem is <laughs> that it's not only the quantity of firms, it's the amount that uh, these firms need. Uh, as President Tokayev said uh, September last year, SMEs are underfinanced by more than 42 billion US dollars. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so at GoCrowd, we offer companies uh, to raise funds through various instruments, such as loans and bonds, common and preferred shares, convertible notes and safes, and revenue sharing ag agreements. And among these, the first and fourth uh, loans and revenue sharing agreements uh, are uh, structures that are, uh, can be done through entities that are not in the AFC. So it can be done with basic uh, limited companies like TO uh, in Kazakhstan. But for uh, these uh, deals, investors would pay uh, income tax. With uh, other types of uh, instruments, investors do not pay income tax as uh, these instruments are done through the AFC structures and are tax exempt. And companies on our platform can raise up to $55 million uh, in one calendar year. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, uh, actually, uh, I think the formatting was uh, bad, so I had actually three points, so let, the, let me speak. So that's the uh, deal structures we have. So at the moment, we're doing the direct lending. So investors, uh, they uh, sign the separate loan agreements and provide money directly to the borrowers uh, in term uh, like loans. Also, we have direct investing is when investors directly uh, purchase shares of the company, so they become uh, the shareholders of the company and it is done directly through the subscription agreement and you do not need any other intermediaries such as exchange or brokers. It can be done on our platform. And the third one that you don't see is the uh, deal structure through the special purpose company. So it's the SPC. Uh, SPC is another legal entity that purchases uh, the shares or uh, yeah, equity of the issuer and we uh, sell uh, the shares of this SPC to our investors. So uh, this structure is good for, uh, uh, st for startups because they do not want a lot of people in their cap tables and when they raise through SPC, they only have one uh, legal entity in their uh, capitalization table and this is good for them because they would uh, raise further investment rounds in the future. So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, oh, come on. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. So, I'll be really quick here. Uh, so, this is uh, our case study. That was the deal we've done, we closed in May. So, this is one of our deals. And uh, this is the company, Kazakh, Kazakhstani company called Kazakh Equipment. It uh, aimed to raise. 100 million tenge, and it offered 30% uh, interest rate for a loan, uh, and the term was uh, 12 months. So uh, what is exciting is that uh, it only it took only two weeks uh, from uh, initial meeting, from saying hello, and up to uh, saying uh, we've sent 100 million to your bank account. So it's really quick, and it's uh, very accessible to uh, any small and medium enterprise in Kazakhstan. And why is it quick? Uh, because we have uh, a quick yet uh, very precise uh, credit scoring of the companies and our investment processes are very smooth. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's the investment process. Uh, anyone who is uh, 18 years or uh, more uh, can register on our platform, uh, go through a quick verification process, uh, then browse the open deals, choose a deal, uh, read everything, sign the agreement online. So both first and second step take 
two minutes. And the third step, that you just pay through the wire transfer to our bank account for the investment, and then we uh, provide it to the company. So yeah, next slide, please. So yeah, thank you. That was really quick. So that's my contact details. Sorry for the formatting. We need to check it before. And that's our Instagram page. Please follow us, and we have all the news over there. Thanks a lot. Thank you. thank you very much indeed. I'd like to thank all the panelists for this. Um, clearly, we have some targets ahead of us. For, with our successors sitting here in 10 years' time, it'll be great if they can say they've got 5,000 shares listed um, with the market capitalization equal to Shanghai and Shenzhen. Um, clearly, there are lots of vehicles and options here. We've had to go through them in great speed, but we hope we've given some insight into the opportunities which AFC is affording to provide investment opportunities for investors and the opportunity for funds and companies in this country to, to raise money. Thank you all very much for your attention.